Hello, um, I'm Laura Marsh. I'm the literary editor of The New Republic. I just want to thank everyone for coming. This is the first in a series of events that The New Republic's hosting here at The Strand, where we'll be talking to novelists and other writers each month. Um, I'm thrilled to have Mary Gateskill here for the first event to talk about her new book, This Is Pleasure. Uh, Mary Gateskill is the author of the story collections Bad Behavior, Because They Wanted To and Don't Cry, and the novels The Mayor, Veronica, and Two Girls Fat and Thin. Her essay collection Somebody With a Little Hammer came out in 2017. Um, before we get into questions, Mary is going to start with a reading, um, then we're going to talk a bit, and then we'll have time for some questions from the audience. I've also been asked um, to prominently remind everyone that there are going to be books at the back, and there'll also be signing. Um, so we were talking a little bit before we came out, and um, I was reminded that Mary actually used to work here, and um, <laughs> has immortalized the experience of working here in her first story collection, Bad Behavior. Yeah, uh, it's always kind of a funny experience to be back here, um, and it's a really different place than it used to be. I worked here in the early 80s. Like now when you ask someone, can you help me find this book? They're like, absolutely, I'm looking it up right here. It's, it's over in this section, and in fact, I'll help you. I'll go there myself and help you find it. And when I worked here, it was like, how would I know? Go find <laughs> it yourself. It's over there somewhere, I don't know. Don't, can't you see I'm busy? It was like a totally different world. Um, anyway, so here it's great to be back at the Strand. And so I guess we're going to start by my reading some of this. And um, this is a, a story about a guy whose um, life has been turned upside down by um, being called out as a sexual harasser, has lost his job. Uh, his social life and over the course of this story. And it's told from the point of view of him, himself, in his own voice, and his friend, a female friend named Margot. And because they're both speak in the I voice, I have to announce each section um, with uh, their initial. When she is speaking, the um, section will be begin with an M. When he is speaking, it will begin with a Q. That's how you know who's talking. And the first section starts with M. I'd known Quinn for maybe five years when he told me this story, really not even a story, more like an anecdote about a woman he'd met on the street. Quinn believed that he could perceive a person's most essential nature just by looking at him or her. He also believed that in the same way he could know what they most wanted to hear or rather what they would most respond to was a little conceited about these supposed special abilities, and that was how the story began. He saw a melancholy-looking woman, a former beauty, as he put it, walking by herself in Central Park, and he said to her, aren't you the gentle one? She replied, and aren't you the perceptive one for seeing it? After a few minutes of talk, he invited her to have tea with him, and she agreed. He didn't describe her further other than to say that she was middle-aged and obviously lonely. She'd never been married, worked in PR, had no children. Even without a visual description, my sense of her was vivid. Her slender forearm and long hand, the outline of her cheek giving off a subtle glow as she leaned slightly forward into his attention, her mind quickened by this odd and unexpected man and he would be leaning toward her, too. Quinn was someone who imbibed people. They exchanged numbers. I asked him if he'd told her that he was about to get married, and he said no, he hadn't. He didn't plan to call her. It was enough to feel the potential between them, stored away like a cell phone video of something that had already happened. She would like being hurt, but very slightly, she'd want affection more. You'd spank her with, I don't know, a ping pong battle maybe? And then touch her clit. This is pleasure. And this is pain. When I repeated this story to my husband, he cracked up. We both did. 
For years after, apropos of nothing, one of us would croak, this is pleasure. My husband would make a perverted face and pinch the air, and this is pain. And both of us would just crack up, just laugh our asses off. The whole thing was vaguely sadistic, but so vaguely that it was ridiculous. Clearly no harm was done. It wouldn't be a good outcome for her, Quinn said. She's open-minded, but sensitive. I'm engaged to a much younger woman, and there wouldn't be any good place that it could go for her. She might have just wanted the experience, I said, if she was lonely. I'm sorry to report that I said that, but really I thought it just might be true. They did speak on the phone finally. She called him. He told her then about his engagement. He said that he'd like her to consider him a kind of guardian angel, psychically watching out for her, which added to the hilarity for my husband and me, even though it also added to the secret sadism. I laughed, but I wondered. Did the woman know, even dimly, that she was being toyed with? Did she feel that there was something wrong with the encounter, the way you might feel a mysterious hair drawn across your cheek? Why did I think it was so funny? It seems strange to me when I look back on it now, because I don't want to laugh. I feel pain, real heart pain. Subtle, but real. Q. Late at night, I went to my office for the last time. I was not allowed to go there during business hours, and I didn't want to. It would have been unpleasant. The managing editor had instructed the security guard to let me in and see me out. Boxes had been packed and shipped already. Before that, my wife had collected an envelope of emergency cash that I had left in a desk drawer. Even she didn't want to set foot in the office. The one sympathetic associate editor agreed to meet her and hand off the envelope at a subway concession stand, a pallid detail that serves only to underscore the level of revulsion Carolina feels about anything connected to my former professional life. Anyway, I'd come one last time to collect an orchid that had somehow survived months of inept watering and to see if any other tiny thing had been left behind. And one had, actually two had, <coughs> though they were not that tiny, nor was I the one who had left them. The first thing was my nameplate, strangely still affixed to the wall outside my office door, importantly announcing the existence of the now non-existent Quinlan M. Saunders. It seemed like a nasty joke, and it was the sharp-browed and maybe pretentious M, especially, that zinged me as I entered what had once been my office, where the second surprise sat quietly on my desk. A little cardboard cigarette box, its original graphic covered by a pasted-on image of a very red apple on a white background, and on the other side, the words, every day equals choices positioned like a brand name in pink and red letters. When one opened the packet, one found not cigarettes, but five very small scrolls of paper arranged with painstaking symmetry. Unscrolled, they read in plain black type, ugliness or beauty, truth or lies, courage or fear kindness or cruelty, love or the space for the last word on the last scroll was left blank. I didn't have to look. I remembered it tenderly well, as in when a doctor presses on your abdomen and asks, is it tender there? Years ago, I'd made this for a girl who still works in the rows of offices opposite mine. A plain girl with short brown hair, bright eyes, and good coloring. Her body was thick-waisted but supple, with a peasant's grace, confident and humble both, and a quiet poise greater than that of most beauties. 
Her eyes took in the world with passive depth and the occasional flash of mortal humor. She was intelligent, more than she realized, and I wanted her to learn how to use her intelligence more actively. The cigarette pack came out of a hallway conversation we'd had about choices and opportunities. I'd spent several afternoons at my desk piecing the little delicacy together in odd, inactive moments. Strange and touching to remember the care I put into it, the sophistication and childishness, how I thought of it in her hands. I invited her to lunch to give it to her, and yes, I was right. When she saw it, that flash lit up not only her eyes, but her entire face. And in that instant, I became for her a magician who had given her an enchanted object. As if I were a magician, she listened to me tell her about herself and what she was like, what she needed, what she needed to correct. We are going on a journey, I said, and we did. At the end of it, she had awakened to her ambition and learned how to satisfy it. As time went on, there were other girls I liked flirting with more. But for years, almost 10 years, I kept our friendship alive with daily compliments and periodic lunches. I still have a handwritten note from her saying that our lunches were the glory of her week. Now, she had returned my gift not to me, but to an empty room. Now she was one of my accusers. I dropped the little box in a wastebasket on my way out, but then, because I did not want to leave, I did not want to leave evidence of such bitter feeling behind me, I turned around to retrieve it. I meant to drop it into a trash can on the street, but instead I took it home and put it in a drawer where Carolina would not find it. M. I met Quinn when he interviewed me for an assistant edit editor position more than 20 years ago. At 35, I was a little old for the job. I was coming from an East Village publication that was venerably outré and was perhaps slow to realize that those two descriptors canceled each other out. <coughs> Besides, it paid almost nothing, and I was looking forward to trading up. I had heard of Quinn. I knew that he was English, from old school wealth, father a banker, mother an organized charity, and that he was eccentric. Still, I was surprised by his appearance. He was at least 40, but he had the narrow frame and form of an elegant boy. His long brown hair fell over his brow in a juvenile style that was completely natural on him. His clothes were exquisite, simply cut, neutral colors but finely tailored, soft, perfectly draped, nothing to stand out except the long silk scarf he wore nearly always around his neck. Without being beautiful, he gave an unexpected impression of beauty. But then he would subtly thrust out his jaw with his lips parted so that his lower teeth were just visible and his narrow face would look strangely insectile and predatory, like something with mandibles. The interview was strange too, whimsical and then unexpectedly cutting. He asked a lot of questions that seemed irrelevant and personal, including whether or not I had a boyfriend. He used my name more often than he needed to and with an oddly intimate intonation that in combination with his British accent seemed not only precise but proper. That proper quality was somehow confusing. When he interrupted me to say, Margot, Margot, I don't think your voice is your best asset. What is your best asset? I was so discomfited and uncertain that I didn't know whether to be offended or not. I don't recall my reply, but I know that I answered abruptly and uncleverly, and then the interview was over. I got another better job, but still, when Quinn's name came up in conversation, and it often did, he had a reputation that was 
somewhat notorious and yet unclear as if people didn't know what to make of him despite how long he'd been around. I vividly remembered his voice and my discomfort and wondered why the feeling had stayed with me. And then, maybe two years later, I met him again at a book fair in D.C. I walked into some tricked-up rental location alone and saw him posing for a picture with two stylish young women who were leaning on his shoulders making funny faces and gangster hand signs. He was looking at the camera, not at me, but as soon as the picture was taken, he excused himself and came over to me. His voice was different this time, full of uncomplicated goodwill and so expansive that I thought he was drunk, which he wasn't. He said that he was glad I was doing well, and when I asked how he knew how I was doing, he said that he'd heard. You bought a book I wanted, only a confident person would go for that book. I'm sure you know which one I mean. But even if he hadn't heard, he continued, he'd been able to tell by looking at me. The room was filled with the swift moving noise of personality. Somewhere in the background was a cake, bottles and flowers. The gangsta girls gestured and grinned to each other delightedly. It all felt like a blessing. Back in New York, we met at a restaurant that had once been a meeting place for the artistic elite, but was now frequented primarily by tourists and business people. We were seated at a deep banquette. Quinn told the waiter that he wanted to sit on the same side as me so that we could talk more easily, and then he was there with his place setting. I'm sure he didn't say this right away, but in my memory, he did. Your voice is so much stronger now. You are so much stronger now. You speak straight from the clit. And as if it were the most natural thing in the world, he reached between my legs. No, I said, and shoved my hand in his face, palm out like a traffic cop. I knew it would stop him. Even a horse will usually obey a hand held in its face like that, and it outweighs a human by nearly a thousand pounds. Looking mildly astonished, Quinn sat back and said, I like the strength and clarity of your no. Good, I replied, that's good. We ordered our meal. We talked about food. He again admired the novel I'd acquired, which had been turned down by every major house, including his, on the grounds that it was misogynistic, though, of course, we didn't call it that. He assessed the other people in the room, imagining what they did for a living and whether or not they were happy. I was unwillingly fascinated, both by the detail of his speculations and how accurate they seemed. He paid, he paid special attention to a stout Japanese man who was lustily eating alone, legs proudly spread, one hand bearing food to his mouth, the other a fist on his splayed thigh. Quinn said that of all the people in the room other than me, this man was the one he'd most like to talk to because he looked as though he were capable of something great. But the main thing I remember from that night was the expression on his face as he retreated from my upraised palm the surprised obedience that was somehow grounded and more genuine than his reaching hand had been. I remember, too, a brief moment after dinner. He walked me home, and we said goodbye so warmly that a young man walking past smiled, as if touched by this middle-aged courtship. I went into my building, and halfway up the stairs realized that I needed milk. I walked back out to a corner deli, as I reached into the cooler for the milk, I glanced to my side and saw a funny man at the other end of the aisle exploring his nose with a very large handkerchief while his other hand rifled through a shelf. His posture was intensely stooped, as if physically manifesting some emotional contraction. I was very surprised to realize that it was Quinn. The posture was so radically unlike the elegant, erect stance I'd seen all night. He was so privately engrossed that he didn't see me, and I felt compelled to leave without buying milk, rather than let him know I'd seen him explore his nose. The next day, he sent me flowers, and the friendship began.
began. Q. I told Margot, and I told my brother. I did not tell my wife, not at first. I still had hope that it would blow over or at least be handled quietly, and my hope was not unfounded. At first, the suit was not against me, but against the publishing house, and all she wanted was a payment, which the company was prepared to make as long as she kept quiet about her complaints. Her, pe her complaints were petty, absurd, which meant, as Margot pointed out, that they were almost impossible to keep quiet about. How could you enforce that, she asked. How would you even know what she was talking about at cocktail parties? Where else was she, would she talk about it? Rape is one thing, but it's not like she can go to the media and report some weird thing you said years ago. Margot was dead wrong. I felt that even as she spoke. But watching her sitting squarely in her sense of reality, speaking confidently as she reached for the salt and lavishly poured it on whatever she was eating, I was reassured. I felt her affection for me, even though she was angry at me too. She took the occasion to tell me how angry she was and had been for years. You treat people like entertainment, she said. You joke and you prod and you push just to see which way they'll jump and how far. You pick it where they're hurt. You delectate their pain. It doesn't sound like this girl has a case legally, but honestly, I can understand why she's mad. You didn't touch her, did you? I mean, sexually? I had not. Just sometimes on the shoulder, around the waist, maybe on the knee or the hip or the leg. Affection, not sex. I so don't want Carolina to find out, I said. She hates male oppression, hates it. <laughs> and Margot laughed. <laughs> did, did you really just say that? You? I said, please, I'm concerned for my wife. She stopped laughing. If it really wasn't sexual, you don't have anything to worry about. But it could be made to sound sexual, or just, she claims it cost her months of therapy bills. Margot laughed again, more meanly. I'm not sure at whom. I'd like you to keep quiet about this, I said. I mean, don't tell anybody, not even Todd. I won't, she said. Don't worry. Thank you so much for reading that. Um, it's fascinating to hear you read it because there's such a range in tone in those four sections. It begins with the couple at home laughing at Quinn and um, the series of awkward incidents and then suddenly everything is very grave. Um, the, the word or the words me too don't appear in this story anywhere but it obviously feels very timely um, I wondered what your starting point was. Oh. Um, uh, my starting point, w is this working? Yes. Um, my starting point was a great deal of confusion. Um, I, Me Too is a thing that I would expect to be completely in favor of, but I found myself feeling ambivalent about it and just confused, um, partly because I knew some people who were um, outed by it, and they were people I knew in one way, and I was hearing about them in a very different way. And so I, part of me was very much on their side, and part of me wasn't. And it was very hard to sort out what I thought. And it turned out, and even harder to sort out what I felt. Um, and so this was a, partly an attempt to confront that, or feel my way around about that, and also to give voice to the confusion, because I think probably I'm not alone in that. Um, I think you can take one side or the other, but I think many people uh, have a lot of mixed feelings about it. 
and even people who I know, most people I know are more unambivalently supportive of it than I am, but even they have moments where they're, they're not quite sure, say, for example, about Al Franken. Um, and so I wanted to just express that feeling of, of ambivalence and confusion. People have used the word nuanced in reference to the piece. I would say, to me, the word is more mixed. Um, because I think that when something that's so powerful comes up and when we're living in such extreme polarized times, it's very hard for people to remember that all human beings are very mixed. And that, especially when you're talking about anything having to do with sex, I think that's even more subject to confusion and mixed up than most subjects. Right. No one in this story quite knows what they think of the other people, especially Margot. She has this anger that rises up in her, but also a lot of loyalty towards Quinn. Well, yes, for her, he's somebody who has really been there for her when she needed somebody, um, who, when she was feeling really vulnerable. I, I didn't read that part. That was kind of the next section where she's feeling really vulnerable and alone and has been abandoned by a friend that she expected to be there for her. He is there, and so that's very hard to forget that, a moment like that. Um, one thing that struck me when I read the story was that it touches on this desire to express a kind of complexity that you've see, sought out in all of your writing. But I'm thinking particularly of the essay that you wrote in Harper's in the early 90s on not being a victim, um, which deals with a lot of the same questions, but in the essay form and drawing on your personal experience rather than inventing a world, which you've done here. Um, I wondered, why you decided to address this in fiction? Um, because I, I have such I, I have a good answer with that usually, but I tend to, because I think because of the ambiguity. Like if I'm writing an essay, it's usually because I know where I come down on a side of a question, and my feelings are more logical. Um, like the, the situation I wrote about in Harper's, I, wrote, I mean, that's kind of a hard thing to bring up because I wrote about a lot of different things, but it, it began with a moment where I was in a situation I was very high on acid with a guy who, in retrospect, I'm not sure he was actually high himself. I think he may have pretended to take it because he wanted to have sex quite a bit, and acid's just not a very sexy drug, so I'm not even sure he actually took it. But anyway... <laughs> Anyway, um, he, I didn't work for him. He was somebody I was uh, th kind of thrown together with. I was staying in uh, Detroit. I was a runaway. I was 16 years old. Um, I had just left, uh, gotten kicked off the bus going to Canada, and I was in this kind of crash pad um, with this guy. And um, it, there was a cultural difference because he was very poor. He lived in a Detroit ghetto. He was African-American. I basically came from the suburbs. We spoke very different languages. So it was like a situation that was very hard to read um, and that was also a very weird mix of inequality. Um, and But still, in that situation, it was clear and that I at least knew I didn't want to have sex with him. Um, but was not sure how to convey that to him or what he really wanted. So it was a different kind of complexity, whereas in this story, in, the, in the many of the Me Too situations, I'm not sure what I think. And, there's, and it's not just one situation. It's many different situations with many different people from the most horrible, like the most clear-cut cases of physical assault to somebody saying weird things. So that's a much more slippery thing mm -hmm. and a situation where I find it hard to come down one way or the other and also where I actively wanted to create to to create a feeling of confusion and ambivalence which I think that many people feel so to that an essay just not the right way to do that mm -hmm. was there a specific event or was there a specific moment in the story where you knew that now you had to write a story about this was what was the, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the place that you start the book is. Where she says heart pain. Where, um, and, and the heart pain at first actually is about the woman who the story is being told about. That at first she thinks it's funny, but then she thinks back, this woman is actually being toyed with. It's a minor incident. It's not, she, she may not even remember it. But it meant she thought, oh, this guy wants to go out with me. She is lonely. She, she thinks, wow, this guy's picked me out on the street. He wants to be with me. And then, no, he's just screwing around. I mean, it's a tiny thing, but th there's pain in that. 
Mm -hmm. And she feels that. And then it gradually transforms into pain for an incident, an experience she had with her friend where she, uh, oh, this isn't a spoiler, but she, she remembers him saying about when she was sexually abused as a child, you helped him. And that is painful for her. And then it also becomes pain for him because he doesn't really quite understand what's happened to him. At one point, they're sitting in a restaurant, and he's, he's saying, I'm, I can feel things turning around for me. I know things are going to get better, and no, they're not. So she feels pain for him as well. So that was the thing, the sort of heart pain at the heart of this, at the center of this for, for everybody, really. Mm -hmm. And it's not the kind of ping-pong battle spanking pain no. that he was talking about at no. the beginning. <laughs> um, well, that brings me to another aspect of the story I've been very eager to ask you about, which is it's full of pain, high consequences, the stakes are huge for him and for most of the other characters in the story, and yet it's very funny. Um, there are so many moments when you're reading that people laughed. Um, Quinn is a kind of a ridiculous figure in some ways. Margot describes the dynamic as being funny awful. Um, and I wondered how you thought about using humor in the, in the story. Well, I think that um, there's a reason the, the classic symbol of theater is the mask of tragedy and the mask of comedy. Um, quite often things that can look hilarious in one moment look really bad when you look at them in a different light. Um, they, they, can, they can bleed into each other. Again, that gets to the feeling of mixed, the mixed quality of experience and the mixed quality of sexuality when something can be really dirty and ugly, but then really turn you on, or vice versa, really turn you on and then flip it another way, and it's like, ugh, why did, no, I didn't want that. Um, so I think that, that they, they, they go together that way. Right, like one, his seduction, this is pleasure and this is pain, to, to the couple, it's, he's a pervert. You know, the pervert voice that you mentioned, it's, it's suddenly kind of grotesque and awful um, and not, not this frisson that he claims to have felt with the woman in the park. Um, it's also a funny world that they move in, though, isn't it? Like it, the venerable but radical magazine that she's yeah. been associated with. This is a world of contradictions and people who take themselves very seriously but also lack self-awareness. Yeah, I mean, I, I've at least one person I know um, that I know in an academic context gave the story to his students and um, they were just like kind of repulsed by it and were, they used the word creepy a lot and he was like to me like wondering how to talk about it with them and I was like actually I understand if I was an undergraduate student I would probably feel the same because I would find the people hard to grasp they, they would be so foreign to my world because they live in a kind of hyper sophisticated universe um, the, the, I mean, everybody who's in that world, um, except maybe the young women that Quinn is, who've just entered it, um, that Quinn is um, in, in what in, importuning, um, they may not quite be the denizens of that world. But but many people who are in publishing, who are in the arts, are very very um, elite. They're occupying a, a very complex world where there is a lot of understanding, at least among many people, of the different sides of this, but that isn't the world that everybody lives in. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned the three girls because um, they're entering this, this world and um, they're not necessarily thinking of things in the same terms Margot and Quinn are. Like, I don't think they would say you delicate pain. You know, they, they don't have that understanding of what's happening and they maybe don't see what he's trying to do. They take it much more seriously. And also they might be experimenting with it. Like, like um, later in the story, one of the women, the woman who winds up really uh, accusing him legally um, is one of the things she's put in her complaint is that he sent her a spanking video. And he says, and in my mind, this is true, she told him he liked, she likes spanking, which isn't a smart thing to do if you're not planning to have sex with somebody. And certainly you shouldn't be talking like that with somebody you work for who's flirting with you if you don't want that kind of problem. But in my mind, she's, therefore, it's not like, oh, there she, therefore she deserved whatever. She's, in my mind, again, I didn't show this scene, I didn't get into Caitlin's head, but in my mind, she's experimenting. 
she's in this world where suddenly every, a lot of different things seem to be allowed and a lot of different things that she you know, may not have grown up with seem to be okay. So she just kind of throws that out, not quite knowing what she's doing or thinking um, or what might come back to her as a result. Mm-hmm. I, I think not something that hasn't been explored very much is I think that there's a lot of confusion, and I think Me Too is an attempt to clarify and create kind of ground rules, because I think that, like, say, back in the 90s, there was a great deal of kind of freewheeling, freewheeling and people just kind of playing in all kinds of arenas, which was great in some ways, but I think also confusing about what is really okay. What, what is a joke and what isn't a joke? When, when is it okay to touch somebody or say something sexual and when it isn't? So I think that um, that created confusion for women, but I think it created confusion for men as well. The character of Quinn seems confused sometimes. I mean, he, um, he kind of, I don't think it's ruining the story to say that he doesn't, think that he's really done anything wrong by the end, he says. No, he doesn't. Um, he says, I walked all the way up to the line. I never crossed it. But other people in the story think that he did cross it, and we, we see him crossing it at certain points. Um, in what sense do you think he's a product of the 90s? And the, I mean, he's sort of 40 years old, so he would have been young then. Um, it's around the same time you were writing your piece in Harper's and there's this big debate between critics of um, feminism like Katie Royfe and then people who are trying to establish firmer rules. How do you feel he comes out of that moment? Well, he's certainly influenced by that moment. I think we're all very powerfully influenced by the moments that we come of age. Um, I couldn't say it entirely explains him, though, because there are many men who came up you know, came of age during that time who would not act like him. Um, so a lot of that is personality as well. But but I do think that if he grew up in the 50s, he would he would behave differently. He is a very unique character. He yes, has... and that's part of why I also wanted to write this story, because to me, like, there's kind of a, a, a picture, which is not untruthful, of a certain type of abuser or guy who will is really... Uh, predator and out to take advantage of people and then there's a very straight up narrow straight and narrow guy who would never do those things but there's also a lot of guys totally totally in between that that are just very unique strange people who have, I mean to me Quinn is just a weird person um, he isn't all bad he isn't all good he's a re- he's a weirdo who's been indulged in a lot of ways by his environment and has has been shaped um, by cultural factors and the fact that he's very upper class and um, lives in a world where the things he's done have been okay, not only okay, but have worked really well for him. Mm. So why would anybody be shocked that he would think that it was okay to keep doing these things? In some ways, is his weirdness an attempt to circumvent the rules that other people have to follow a little more closely? I don't even think he'd think about it. Um, like that. I, I think he would just, he, he, well, he would think perhaps in terms of conventions and flouting conventions. And I, I, he says towards the end that it's that something about a truth being shown. Like he thinks of a time that he was in a, a nightclub in the 80s where he had sex with a girl in a bathroom. And then he felt kind of weird and uncomfortable. So he asked her for a number, even though he probably didn't really want it. And she just bolted. Um, and that there was there was a truth there's a truth in saying certain blunt things and doing certain blunt things that's very valuable to him that he would say is more valuable than politeness or convention and I understand that actually because I I came of age during that time too and and as you may be able to tell from my affect I am not a really like gaudy person who is really like out there and loud and, and like looking to uh, push people's buttons. I'm by my nature very polite. But so for me it was interesting to, to grow up in that time where I was challenged a lot. And I don't just mean sexually, I mean in terms of how I could respond to aggression or how, how I could, could I say no to somebody? Um, could I hold my own in a certain situation? Some people say you shouldn't have to. I don't know. 
And it wasn't always physical. Like when I was writing this story, I, I almost didn't, ha I have a spanking incident that occurs and I was like, another spanking incident. Can't you do better? Why does it have to always? <laughs> so I, I tried to come up with another thing that maybe he transgressed um, in some way that, that, that the girl told, tells him a story not about fantasizing about spanking, but she tells him a story about her dog when she was a girl. I mean, I hope you're not grossed out to hear this, but it, it's just, it, it's an innocent story really that she tells him in confidence that when she was a kid, her dog actually went down on her. And, and it was just really startling to her, and, 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 but she was turned on. I mean, and, and so he sends her a video that's a Frank Zappa um, song that was big in like the 70s, Dirty Love. Um, I don't know if any of you know that song. It's a great song. And, it's, and the chorus is, poodle bites, come on, Frenchie, poodle chews, it's snack bet, poodle bites, come on and not a speck of cereal for my dog and and it's about and like your mama makes that fuzzy poodle chew but that but it's also got <laughs> it's also got lyrics like um uh, I don't want your cheap aroma or your little boat peep diploma I'll just put you in a coma I don't want your reservation I don't need no hesitation I just I just I got only want one destination and that's your dirty love and when I was a kid like when I was 14 I did not I did not like that song I th actually, I wasn't that young. I think I was 15, but it's, you know, very similar. I was actually kind of offended by it because I'm like, e e really, my feelings don't matter at all. <laughs> and to me, it was like lecturing the entire young girl population of America and saying, I, I, I really, I don't care about what you feel. I just want you to spread your legs. And by the way, your mom's a dirty B-I-T-C-H. And yeah, I did not, I did not like that. I didn't, I didn't like it one bit. But I recognized it was a cool song. I recognized the, the music. And every guy I liked just worshipped Frank Zappa, which also irritated me. Like, why is this guy like the priest, priest who's telling everybody what to feel? But because of that, I had to, like, think. I had to, like, feel and think about my offense. Not that I thought it out that rationally at the time. I was a kid. But I had to get my head around the idea that what he was singing about, I don't think Frank Zappa really expected teenage girls to, you know, listen to him that much. Um, I think he was just expressing a desire for real, pure, just boom, right now, sexuality. And that I didn't have to live by that. I didn't have to, like, use that as a, like, manual for how I'm supposed to conduct myself with boys. Most boys certainly didn't expect that. Um, it, but it was just like an anthem for like, yeah, just pure joy of feeling and raw sex. And that that's all it was. That was it was just an expression of that thing. And that for that, it was pretty great. And I think ultimately that I, that I had to like wrap my head around that idea was good for me in, in the long run. And even, that it, even if it did piss me off and irritate me, um, in my 20s, I danced naked to it. But I, oh, <laughs> I shouldn't say that for the podcast. Oh, that can totally <laughs> go in the podcast. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, I, but I also think, you know, it may be good for certain, for men to get their heads around the other thing, that they may be offended by the fact that some girls don't like being talked to in a certain way and that girls don't like it when their employer wants to hear about what they think about when they masturbate. Uh, I think it might be good, you know, to go the other way too, and for men to be challenged that way as well. You know, it, it goes both ways. Um, does, does that answer your question? Whatever. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, oh. So a few people do challenge Quinn's story. Yeah. Um, we heard one example of it, which is Margot saying no. Um, but it's it's not a straightforward. It's not as straightforward as just saying no. It, it seems. Every woman in this story who says no to Quinn is still angry about it afterwards. Like she says she feels like a traffic cop and um, she compares it to halting a horse. Like suddenly it's not me and you, it's me the cop and you the guy or me the horse trainer and you the animal. It, it shifts somehow. It's not, um, it's not what you would think it would be. Just, it's not this empowering act empowering act of just saying no. 
Well, in, interesting about that, but well, because he doesn't stop. I mean, he stops for for Margot, although not entirely. I mean, from what she's saying, he he says from says things that continue to push. But uh, the thing that's when I thought about that scene, that where she tell where she puts her hand in his face, and when she notes that there's something about his response that's more genuine than the aggression, it's almost like he wants. It, there, there's a real connection when you say no forcefully mm -hmm. to somebody, when you don't just avoid them. Um, that is, I think sometimes when people transgress, they might be looking to dominate, but and they might be looking for connection through domination. But there's also connection when you really do say no. Um, and And that's a way of connecting also. And I think that unless somebody is really truly dangerous, um, they they will respect that. But then a lot of women, I'm sure, maybe there's people in the audience who would say, uh, actually, no, where I worked, I, I did do that repeatedly, and it wasn't enough. Um, so there, there's a lot of, there, there's no straight, straight answer on that mm -hmm. question. Um, I've just realized I probably only have time to ask you one more question before uh, we make time for some questions from the audience. Um, so I want to zoom back and talk about the politics that the story exists in a little more. There's a moment later in the story, which you didn't read from, um, where Quinn seems to suggest that he's almost a scapegoat for the anger that women feel in the Trump era. He says they can't come at the king, so they're coming for the jester, and that's me. Um, and he doesn't quite take personal responsibility for anything he's done. He sees it. He doesn't mention Trump, but I took that to be yeah, uh, a, a point where the story is touching this moment, uh, but specifically the president. And I wondered how much that was on your mind. Well, I, I do think it's true. He's not, he's avoiding responsibility, but I also do think there's some truth to that. Uh, I think that, I mean, how could people not be affected by that we have uh, uh, someone in the White House who is uh, abusive on a, on a mega scale um, and cannot be stopped by people putting their hand out or saying no or seemingly by nothing. Um, that has to be, that has to affect people on a very profound level and make them want to draw very hard lines whenever it is humanly possible to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I think that really affects the way one might read the story, too. Yeah, I mean, when people have more, like in the 90s, I think, right or wrong, I think people felt felt that society was in, a, a, America was in a good place economically, and people felt relatively unthreatened. And so that's when you can be very open and liberal about all kinds of things. But when, when you see real threat happening to people, uh, like terrible things happening on the border, um, people's children being taken from them, people being murdered, people being uh, really abused. There's child abusers in, in, in places where children are being held in ICE. And, you know, really vile things happening, then people become much more needing to be very, very, no, this is right, this mm -hmm. is wrong, you're on one side or the other. And that's just human nature. Um, so I think I should... Um hand over to the audience now for some questions. Okay. I'm going to put glasses on so I can actually see people. Um, and yeah, so if anyone has a question, you just want to raise your hands, and I think um, Carsten is going to come around with this microphone. Hi, Mary Lucy Ferris. Good to see you. Um, you have, there are a couple of images of horses in the story. That's what, what I wanted to ask about. There's, she um, has this image of Quinn as a horse, and then later she tells him that women are like horses. They want to be led. And I wondered if we were meant to connect those two horse images in, a, in some sort of gendered way. Um, no, not really. I, I think um, uh, Margot's just a little bit of a horsey person. <laughs> um, so, and, and horses are animals that, that do respond very plainly to signals of um, stop, go, um, 
I lead, you lead. Um, horses do like to be led, but they don't always, and they won't. They're not easily led necessarily, unless it's a very well trained horse, and and they do need to be respected too. Very big mistake if you think you're going to lead a thousand pound animal without respecting it. So, and and I don't me mean for that metaphor, by the way, that women are like horses to be mean absolutely literal. It just people talk, people speak in generalities in real life. So that's what she's doing. There's another question here. Hello, thank you for, for the reading. Um, I was wondering if you could talk oh, hello. Um, a little bit more about the process of switching between those two perspectives. Was there one that was more difficult? Did you find it easy to go between Quinn and Margot or um, did you have to sit down and write one and then write the other? Um, no, I went, I went between them pretty naturally. Um, I had to think a little bit more about his voice than hers, but um, I, I didn't find either one of them terribly difficult. I, I feel like they're people that I, um, there are ty both of them are types of people that I've come to know quite well because of my profession. I think we have time for one more question, yeah. Um, I was just going to ask what kind of research, if any, that you did when you were creating this book? I, I read a lot of um, articles about the various Me Too cases um, and, and some blogs that had been written about them. That, that's really all I did that I can remember. <laughs> okay, yeah, last question here. Very, very quick, it's even a yes or no, but you said that you were kind of trying to work something out you know, work out that question for yourself by writing this, do you feel like you did? Uh, no. Um, I, I've changed, a, but my thoughts and feelings have changed a bit. Um, I think I let Quinn off a little light, honestly. Um, if I did a sequel, it would be called, And This Is Pain. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but uh, my, my thoughts and feelings about it are still evolving, definitely. Um, okay, we have time for one, one last, last, last question, then we really do have to finish. I have a question. Can I just make a comment? Uh, if it's a very brief comment. Okay. Just, I was, couldn't help think about the complexity of the mother-child relationships in the mayor, only because... Um, you know, power and, uh, I'm really generalizing, but, you know, power and being punished isn't always separate from love and uh, being cared for. I, uh, anyway, I just, I guess I'm just applauding the complexity of relationships in the mayor, which I know is not uh, germane. Well, thank you. But, and I wish, I hope, if somebody wants to talk to me, like, I, if, if somebody didn't have a chance to express um, criticism or question, I don't know, say something that they feel like the book didn't address, then you can do that while I, when I'm around, um, if you didn't have the chance to do that here. Um, well, I think, that's, I think that's all we have time for. Um, I absolutely would love to read, and this is pain. <laughs> so I, and I hope that's coming. Um, thank you so much, Mary. Um, I also should say we'll be back here next month on December 6th talking to Carmen Maria Machado. Uh, and don't forget that we have books at the back. If you haven't got a copy of This Is Pleasure yet, then I strongly encourage you to pick one up. And I think that Mary will be hanging around for a little bit, possibly to sign copies. Yes, good. Um, okay, well, thanks so much. Yeah.